Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Monica Anderson. When I was six years old, I had this pink and purple bike that I just loved. Every day I couldn't wait to run outside and ride my bike. But one day, I went outside and my bike was gone. It had been stolen. So I went crying to my parents, asking them to buy me a new one. But back then, they were raising four kids. They didn't have a lot of money, so a new bike just wasn't an option. So I just cried and cried because I missed my bike so much. But eventually, I realized I had to dry my tears because crying wasn't going to bring my bike back. So I just had to find new ways to go outside and enjoy myself. And it seems like at that young age, I learned a life lesson. And that is that when setbacks and disappointments happen, you can't sit around and cry about it. At some point, you just have to suck it up and keep it moving. And that's how I approached every setback throughout life. Like in middle school, when all the other girls had already started to develop, and I still had my mosquito bites, <laughs> I had to suck it up and keep it moving. Or like after high school, when I went to New York to be this world famous modern dancer, but then I got there and realized I wasn't as good as I thought I was. I had to suck it up and keep it moving. Or like in my 20s, when I got with that guy that I knew would be my Prince Charming, but he turned out to be one of the Three Stooges instead. <laughs> I had to suck it up and keep it moving. And this got me through so many setbacks and disappointments in my life. But then 2018 came along, and two major events happened that just turned my world upside down and made me rethink my suck it up and keep it moving perspective. But it all started out with some very good news. So I wasn't feeling well for a couple weeks, and I didn't really know what was wrong, but I looked at a calendar and realized I could be pregnant. And just the idea of being pregnant seemed impossible because for years my husband and I have been trying to have a baby and nothing worked. We tried infertility treatments, injections, taking this, tracking that, and nothing worked. So the idea that I would be pregnant now when we weren't trying anything seemed impossible. But I took a test anyway. So I'm in the bathroom, I'm waiting for it to calculate, and I'm in the mirror giving my usual pep talk and because this wasn't my first rodeo. Throughout the years, I had taken many tests that had all been negative, so I wasn't really expecting this one to be different. So I'm just in the mirror, like, no matter what happens, you'll get through it, everything will be fine. So finally, the test is done. I take a deep breath, I open my eyes, and the test is positive. And I'm just so happy. And it was one of those digital tests, so it said the word pregnant. Me, pregnant after so many setbacks, I'm just so happy. So I tell my husband, and he is just beyond. He's in daddy mode, and he's like, oh, we're going to get a great crib. It's going to be like a real wood crib. we got to put it together. I'm going to paint the room, and my dad and my brother will help me do this. And he's taking pictures every day of my growing baby belly. But I think we're most excited to tell our son that he's going to be a big brother. So he was 13 at that time, but when he was about six years old, he had asked, when am I going to have a brother or sister? And I remember saying, well, why do you want to have a sibling? And he thought about it, and then he said, well, if I get in trouble, I can blame it on them, and they'll be in trouble instead. So, <laughs> so I was just happy to tell him he'll have somebody to share the blame with. So I just wanted to share the news in such a special way with him, and I just daydreamed every day. How would I surprise him? How would we tell him? And Christmas was coming up in a few months, so I just thought, what if I got this shirt made for him that said, World's Greatest Big Brother, and he would open it up on Christmas Day, and I know he would be like, what? But I'm not a big brother. And we would be like, surprise, yes you are, we're having a baby. And the Christmas lights will be twinkling in the background, and I'm just sure the snow will be falling in a perfect heart shape <laughs> around our house. I watched a lot of Disney movies growing up, so don't judge me. And I just daydreamed about this perfect moment, and I knew it was going to be great, and I'm just feeling on top of the world. And so one day, I go to the bathroom, and there's blood. And it's a lot of blood. And instantly, I know something's wrong. A visit to the doctor confirmed that I had a miscarriage. I was devastated. 
and before where my husband went into daddy mode to fix everything and make everything right, this time there was nothing he could do to fix it. And even though my son didn't even know I was pregnant, my heart still ached for him because he had just lost a sibling and a relationship that I knew would have been so beautiful. And I took the loss the hardest because it wasn't my first loss. Years before, I'd had a baby and he was born way too premature and his lungs and kidneys weren't developed enough to survive outside my body. So he lived for one hour and he died in my arms. It had taken me years to get beyond that and to follow it up with another loss just it seemed so unfair and so cruel. I cried and I cried, but eventually I realized I had to dry my tears because crying wasn't gonna bring my baby back. And just like all the times before, I had to suck it up and keep it moving. So that's exactly what I did. So months go by, and again, I'm still not feeling well, but this time it's not like morning sickness. This time it feels more serious. Some days I have migraines so bad that they drop me to my knees and make me sick to my stomach. Some days my muscles have these involuntary movements and it feels like I'm being pricked with a thousand hot needles. Some days I have a concert of symptoms so bad that I can't even get out of bed. I go from doctor to doctor, specialist to specialist, they run test after test, and eventually I'm told, in a very cold and clinical way, that there's an autoimmune disorder that I have. It's affecting multiple systems of my body, including my reproductive system, and there's no cure. All they can do is give me pills I'll have to take for the rest of my life, some of which has side effects just as bad as my current symptoms. I was devastated. Why me? Why now after just losing my baby? You know, I wouldn't say that I was depressed, but I felt kind of like a wounded fish in the water. And like depression was like a hungry shark circling around me, just waiting for the moment that I would be weak enough so it could devour me. So every day, I spent time just trying to keep my head above water and stay out of the jaws of depression. And anybody who knows me knows I'm not a depressed type of girl. I'm more of a, the sun will come out tomorrow, the glass is half full, you can have some of my glass because everything is sunshine. But during this time, I couldn't help feeling like there was this constant cloud over me and I couldn't pierce through that to get back to the sunshine that I'm used to and I didn't know what to do. But then one day, in a very unlikely way, everything changed. So I'm watching TV and there's this medical reality show on and this woman goes into the doctor. She has what started out as a pimple on her neck that had gotten infected and now it was a mass hanging out of the side of her neck. And the doctor asked her, why didn't you come in sooner to get this taken care of? And she said, well, I didn't have health insurance and there was nothing I could do, so I just moved on with my life and I didn't do anything to heal. And in that moment, her words grabbed me because even though she was talking about her pimple, I felt like she was talking about my life because that's exactly how I had been living my life. I had these wounds and this great pain and instead of helping myself to heal. I was just trying to suck it up and keep it moving, but I was hurting. I was hurting. I needed to heal. And I thought I was being strong by moving forward, but that's not strength. Strength is being able to look your pain in the face and do what you can to help yourself. Otherwise, if all I'm doing is moving forward, then I have this gaping wound that's being untreated. And a wound is not, when it's not treated, it gets infected. An infection for her looked like the mass hanging out of the side of her neck. An infection for me looked like me fighting off depression. I needed to heal. And in that moment, inspired by her disgusting pimple, I now knew exactly what I needed to do. The best way to heal any wound is to care for it. 
So I set out on a journey of self-care. And my first stop was to therapy, to tend to my mental health. I sat down and talked with someone and just expressed myself. And I don't know why there's such a stigma around seeking treatment for mental health, because it's just as important as your medical health, your dental, your vision. But I digress. <laughs> And so the next stop on my journey of self-care was to tend to my physical health. I haven't taken a single pill those doctors told me I would have to take. Instead, I started seeing a naturopathic doctor, and I'm taking natural supplements made from the earth that have no side effects. And I've changed to a plant-based diet, and I go boxing three days a week. Welcome to the gun show. <laughs> And I'm doing everything that I can to take care of my physical health. And there are still some days where I cannot get out of bed. But I'm much further in my healing than I would be if I did nothing but take pills for the rest of my life. And the final stop on my journey of self-care was to deal with my, my emotional health. So I turned what would have been my baby's room into a space of prayer and meditation. And at five o'clock every morning, I go upstairs, I lock the door, I pray, I meditate, sometimes I cry. And in that space, I had to have a very real conversation with myself and admit that I may not ever have a baby. It may not be in the cards for me. But what am I gonna do, sit around and be bitter about it? Like, why be infertile and bitter? That's a terrible combination. <laughs> so. Infertility is something I can't control, but my reaction to it and the way I choose to live my life, that is what's within my power. So I'm going to exercise my power to live my best life. And if in doing so, by some miracle, I'm able to have a baby, I'll welcome that baby with open arms. And if for some reason I'm not, at least I'm living the best life that I possibly can. So inspired by my journey of self-care, I started a nonprofit organization called Remembering Cherubs, where we provide emotional support and guidance to mothers following pregnancy loss. And at the heart of our mission is healing through self-care. You know, I never did get to have that magical Disney moment with my family, but these days we're having magical moments in a different way because my husband is the president of Remembering Cherubs Nonprofit, and our son is an active volunteer. And as we move forward together, we are truly showing the world what healing really looks like. You know, a baby is birthed from pain and love. And in some way, this organization is exactly that. So it turns out that I had a baby after all, and I didn't have to have stretch marks <laughs> to do it. And through this baby, born of purpose, I'm able to share my new perspective. And that is that when setbacks and disappointments happen, don't just suck it up and keep it moving. Instead, suck in a deep breath, take care of yourself, and keep on healing. Thank you. Monica Anderson.